Hi, good evening, everyone. We're just gonna wait a few more, uh, a minute or two for folks to log on, so thank you. Great to see we have a lot of participation this evening. We have about 65 participants so far. Maybe just a, another or a minute or so. We're we're about up to 80, 80 attendees. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I, I think it's stopped for a little bit. We're about 92 attendees. So thank you so much for being with here uh, with us this evening. Before we get started, um, we'll just do some brief introductions so that uh, you know who we are. And then we have a few questions uh, to better understand who is joining us this evening. So I'll go ahead and get started. I'm Deanna Chow. I'm the Assistant Community Development Director here with the City of Menlo Park and um, working on the housing element with our team here and, and happy to be here tonight. I'll kick it over to uh, Tom Smith. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Smith, acting principal planner uh, with the city of Menlo Park and working as part of the housing element update team. Um, I will pass it to Cal. Good evening, everyone. My name is Calvin Chan. I'm a senior planner with the community development department for the city of Menlo Park. And I'm also a part of the housing element update team. I'll turn it over to Hugh. Hi, this is Hugh Louch. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for Transportation. Uh, nice to be with you all tonight. And why don't I pass it to Jeff? Thanks, Hugh. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your evening to join us tonight. I'm Jeff Bradley with the Metropolitan Planning Group, a private planning consulting group uh, based in Campbell, uh, working for the City of Meadow Park on the housing only. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Sung Kwon, Principal Planner with M Group, um, Project Managing the Housing Element, along with Safety and EJ. Good evening, Mira Doherty, City Attorney for Menlo Park, and happy to be here this evening. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. Great, thank you. And um, we are now uh, have 101 attendees, so thank you all for your spending your evening with us. Um, again, we are here to uh, discuss the flood school site as part of the housing element update. Um, and maybe we'll just roll through the agenda quickly. So thanks. 
So at a, at a, uh, part of tonight's meeting, uh, we'll spend a few minutes uh, with some first some polling questions to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we will then do uh, a brief presentation, which will first focus on the site itself, uh, and then have a brief overview of the development review process. Uh, and this is all with the intent to have uh, a, a create a, a set of common uh, set of information. Um, we know that it's important to uh, we it's important for us to hear from you. Uh, and following the presentation, we will have a listening session uh, where we'll be able to hear your feedback on the flood school site. Uh, we know there are questions and uncertainties about the site. Uh, we may not have all the answers for you this evening, but we are here to listen and to receive your feedback. Um, and we will follow up with information if needed. So um, I will kick it over to Cal, who we will do um, a brief polling, uh, and also he'll go through some of the logistics in terms of hand raising. And we would like to get a, a better sense of um, how many participants we would like to uh, provide feedback this evening so we can gauge our, our session and our time with you this evening. So thank you. Thanks, Deanna. So we'll just take a moment to go over some of the Zoom features this evening, just so that everyone is familiar. So if you would like to provide comment at this meeting, please press the raise hand button on your computer or tablet. If you're joining us by phone, please feel free to dial star nine. During the listening session portion of this meeting, if you have your hand raised, we'll be able to call on speakers one by one and send you a pop-up not notification so that you can unmute your microphone to provide your comment. If you're joining by phone, you can dial star nine to unmute and provide your comment. And lastly, if you would like to provide a written comment, please feel free to use the chat feature to send a message to the project team. We will be saving and reviewing all public comments during this community meeting. So next we'll go through a, a quick welcoming polling exercise to get to know who's in the room with us today. So the first polling question that we invite you to participate is, is have you previously attended a City of Menlo Park housing element update event? A is yes and B is no. Give another five seconds for responses. Thanks everyone for participating. So it looks like about 57% of our audience here today, which is about 120 folks have previously participated in a housing element update event and about 43%, this is their first time, so welcome. Move on to our second polling question. Do you live and or work in Menlo Park? A, I live in Menlo Park, but work somewhere else. B, I live and work in Menlo Park. C, I live in Menlo Park and I am retired or currently do not work. D, I work in Menlo Park, but live somewhere else. E. I lived in Menlo Park until recently, but have since moved away, or F, none of the above. And we'll give a, a few more seconds for responses to trickle in. Okay, I'm ending the poll now. So it looks like the large majority of our audience here today, uh, about 40% live and work in Menlo Park, followed by 23% of folks who live in Menlo Park but work somewhere else. And then the third place would be, I live in Menlo Park, but currently retired or not working. Thanks everyone. We'll move on to our third polling question. So for folks here that live in Menlo Park, um, please indicate the city council district that you live in. Uh, district one, which encompasses the Bellhaven, Bayfront, and Haven Avenue neighborhoods. District two, which comprises the Willow Suburban Park, Lower Lime Manor, and Flood Triangle. District three, which comprises Linfield Oaks, Vintage Oaks, Park Forest, and Felton Gables. District four, which encompasses downtown and allied arts. 
or District 5, which is West Menlo, Sharon Heights, and Stanford Hills. Or if you don't live in Menlo Park, please feel free to choose option F. And we'll now show a map of these council districts in case helpful for you and your responses. Give another five seconds for people to put in their responses. Okay. Thanks everyone. So it looks like about 71% of folks here at this meeting are from District 2, which comprises the Willow Suburban Park, Lorelei Manor, and White Triangle. Okay, we'll move on to our final polling question for this evening. Which is, do you live in the Suburban Park or the Fly Triangle neighborhood? Uh, yes, A, I live in Suburban Park. B, I live in Flood Triangle. C, I live in another, another Menlo Park neighborhood. Or D, I do not live in Menlo Park. Give another five seconds for responses. Our participation rate for these surveys, uh, for this polling exercise is about 80 to 90% of about 120 to 130 participants. Okay, I will end the poll now. So it looks like about 63% of folks here this evening live in Suburban Park, 8% live in Flood Triangle, 16% live in another Menlo Park neighborhood, and 12% uh, reside outside of Menlo Park. I'm gonna stop sharing now and remind folks that if you would like to provide a comment at this meeting to please press the raise hand button on your computer or tablet. If joining by phone, you can do so by dialing star nine. As of this moment, I see that we have three hands raised. Um, so we will have our listening session following a brief staff presentation. And uh, at that time, we'll call on speakers. If at any point you wanna provide your comment, please feel free to raise your hand. And I'll now turn it over to Sung, who will give us a brief site presentation. Great, thanks, Calvin. Uh, next slide. So this is the site, um, as you can see from the aerial. Next slide. And here is a site plan of the site, so you can get a little bit oriented. Um, you'll see in the purple, that's the extent of the site in, in question. And then Haven House is next door. Uh, Flood Park takes up all the green area, and then there's also the SFPUC pipeline that goes underneath Flood Park. And then, as you can see in the dotted line, there's a sound wall that is adjacent to Caltrain property. Uh, next slide. To give you some um, existing conditions, so the area is 2.6 acres. It's currently vacant and a former school. It's one of the few vacant lots in Menlo Park. The zoning designation is R1U, which allows for single family and ADU with a minimum lot size of 7,000 square feet. Uh, conditionally allowed uses are public utilities, private schools, churches, child daycare centers, and home occupations. Uh, this site has an AFFH score of two because there's walking distance to Flood Park and bus stops. Um, the buses are school oriented. Uh, next slide. So one of the options that we're proposing is to put the um, overlay, um, the HO, on top of all the opportunity sites. And that would allow for 30 dwelling units per acre at market rate, and then up to 100 dwelling units per acre for 100% affordable. And that would result in a maximum allowance of 78 units for market rate with 12 um, affordable units, or if they went completely affordable to 260 units. Um, and I will turn it over to Tom to talk about the development review process. Thank you, Sung. So um, there has not been a development application submitted at this time for the project site, um, but, uh, and the, the zoning for the site is still under consideration. Um, as Sung mentioned, there's a general idea of the density that would be proposed, but 
in terms of other development regulations, um, like setbacks, height, things like that, we're still working through that process of developing um, those regulations. Generally, the development review process for a multifamily housing project would be um, first receiving the application um, from, from an applicant, and then staff would review that application for compliance with the zoning regulations. Um, there would be an architectural review to look at the design of the proposed project. And then there would also be an analysis of environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act to determine if it needs um, any sort of environmental clearance, whether that would be uh, if it would be exempt or need a negative declaration, um, mitigated negative declaration or uh, an environmental impact report. And so based on that review for compliance, um, there would be uh, potential revisions to the project to make sure that it, it meets the requirements that are laid out in the city's codes and uh, regulations and other state uh, regulations as well. And then um, eventually, once the project has been uh, addressed to meet all of the requirements, there would be a review by the Housing Commission um, to take a look at uh, the proposal and, and how it provides below market rate units um, as part of the project. Uh, there would be review by the Planning Commission to look at the entitlements, which would typically be um, potentially a use permit, architectural control, uh, subdivision, um, those kinds of things. And then potentially city council if, if there was a subdivision that was proposed as part of the project. Um, one thing to note is that there are state laws in effect that could increase development potential above that base density of 30 dwelling units per acre. And it could also, there are some state laws that could streamline the permitting process and timeline. And so um, some of those laws might, might affect the overall project schedule by shortening or reducing the number of, of meetings that um, could be public meetings that could apply to the project and things like that. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind uh, until we figure out the specifics of, of a potential project, um, those things could be, could affect the development process. And so now I, I think we're ready to enter into the listening session. Um, we have the chat. I see that there are some, some comments there. Uh, we were mentioning that hands have been raised. Um, before we do that, I would note that if you are interested in more about the housing element and, and the purpose and requirements uh, around that, we do have a project website at menlopark.org slash housing element. We would certainly invite you to take a look and provide us with any uh, feedback or questions that you have based on that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. So at this time, I'll remind folks that if there is uh, interest in providing a public comment this evening, please press the raise hand button on your tablet or computer, or if you're joining us by phone, please feel free to press star nine. So we have about seven speakers right now. So, and we'll go ahead and start calling on speakers and I'll, I'll list the name of the speaker and then also tell uh, who is the upcoming speaker. And if you can limit your comments to about two to three minutes at max, that will give us enough opportunity to ensure that everyone has an opportunity uh, to provide their feedback this evening. So I'll start with the first person as shown on my screen, and that will be Jenny Del Busco, followed by Doug Hamilton. And Sung will be projecting his screen right now just to take some notes on questions that um, will help guide uh, further discussion of this project. So thank you, everyone. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Jenny Del Busco. Please feel free to provide your public comment. Thank you very much. So what I find frustrating in these discussions and these housing element discussions is the flood school site, that's public land. That site is school land for public benefit held in trust by Ravenswood School District for the benefit of the public. Menlo Park with an educational mission it is not for the shareholders of Alliant, which is part of NYSE listed Walker and Dunlop, the developers. 
whose legions of lobbyists and attorneys have partnered with Ravenswood School District to push this proposal into consideration by Menlo Park City Hall today, which is to bypass public land use restrictions and protections and obtain public land for private profit. Now, California has strong land use restrictions, which the city attorney who's participating here can inform everyone about because it's known, and including restrictions on the sale or lease of school sites, including the flood school site. However, WD, the developer, the and I'm citing to the, pub, the uh, NYSC listed entity, is able to bypass those protections, which would otherwise force that school district to use that school land, that public land for public benefit. They're able to bypass that because let's be clear, a 99 year lease with permanent changes, permanent changes to that land, a permanent conversion, that's a de facto sale. It's a sale of our public land and a conversion of public use to serving WD shareholders. And I'll repeat that because it's important. A 99 year lease with permanent structures and renewal terms, that's a de facto sale and permanent conversion. And it's only possible if Menlo Park City Hall includes our public land in this housing element. So let's be clear, if that site is not including in the housing element, Ravenswood School District has can under California law use the land for an educational purpose, which includes affordable housing for teachers. That's fine. Or they must sell or lease that land to another public entity that will put it to a public use with priorities, such as Menlo Park City School District, which is desperate for land and is running out of land and has contacted Ravenswood to discuss that site to no avail. And that plan, this plan, this proposal is only possible if City Hall includes the site in the proposal under this loophole in California law that would otherwise protect our public land. Only through exploiting that loophole can WD convert our public land into a WD shareholder asset, a new gem in their $16 billion asset portfolio today. Everyone wants affordable housing in California. I want affordable housing in California, and I devote my pro bono work to communities in need of affordable housing. This proposal, it doesn't serve my clients. It does not serve Menlo Park schools. This proposal exploits a loophole to serve WD shareholders alone. And I will close by quoting my hero, Cesar Chavez. It's never about the grapes or the lettuce. It is always about the people. And so I just wanna speak up and say, please remove our public land from this housing element and serve the people of Menlo Park. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Doug Hamilton, followed by Eric Olson. Doug, if you can accept the unmute, you can provide your comment at this time. Okay, let's move on to. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm not sure. Did, did I get it? through now yes we can hear you thanks doug okay well i i'm not used to using you're attending a zoom meeting and so i'm just pushing buttons and i don't know what it, i didn't mean to push in something i didn't need to do but uh i'm opposed to whatever development that they're wanting to do on that property so that's the only thing i got to say thank you for your comment Next speaker will be Eric Olson, followed by Ken Chan. Uh, this is Eric Olson. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. So uh, thank you for your, your attention to this. And uh, when we look at the flood school side and you look at the objective criteria that are supportive of high density development. Uh, I think that, that it fails those criteria uh, at, at every level and, and in, in every opportunity. And let me just cover uh, some of the major ones. First, environmental justice. This is uh, a site that is next to the freeway sound wall. It has sound pollution, it has air pollution, it's literally so has so much pollution that they cannot build a school site there. And yet we wanna put housing uh, in that location. Uh, access to transit, uh, 
this the only transit that it would be available or is nearby to this location, given that it's landlocked by flood school and by the residential community, is a bus line that is restricted for use by middle school students. So it would not be available to the residents. There is no access to transit. Access to major roadways, it fails that criteria. The only access way is through a residential community at the end of a cul-de-sac, single point access through narrow streets that will direct all of the traffic in and out of this location that could be 100 to 260 uh, units, could be double that in, tr in transit through and back through the residential community. Public safety, it fails that criteria because for the same reason of the single point of access and because of the narrow streets, there is a risk that emergency vehicles would not be able to get through, wouldn't be able to get through quickly. It's my understanding that the fire department has a concern that, that their larger vehicles could not make the turn onto Sheridan. So it fails that criteria. Access to schools. This site, if developed, would end up in a pocket, a segregated pocket of students that would go to the Ravenswood schools and not to the Menlo Park City schools. And so literally it creates a segregated location in which all of the other residents and children around them are going to different schools than the people who would live in this development. And then is it consistent with the surrounding community uh, high density development in this location is not consistent with any of the other parcels around it, all of which are single family housing. Uh, and putting in as many as 260 units, which is more than the total number of units of, of, of housing units in suburban park, and you need to expand into flood park and otherwise, the flood triangle and, or otherwise in order to meet the net, the net natural boundaries uh, is just an inconsistent development. So when we look at these objective criteria, it does not match uh, those that would be appropriate for or uh, should be supportive of such high density development. And I just implore the city, the planning department to, to look and think seriously about these objective measures and, and exclude this from a high density development as a part of this housing element until at least these issues could be resolved and until other sites that have better access, better schools, better public safety criteria and better environmental justice criteria are able to be developed. Thank you and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. Next speaker is Ken Chan, followed by Renee Spooner. Hello, can everyone hear me? All right. Yes, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, hello, Menlo Park staff members. Uh, my name is Ken Chan, and I'm an organizer with the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Uh, we work with our communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality affordable homes, which has led to uh, the reason as to why I'm here tonight. Um, on behalf of HLC, I'd like to express our support for the Ravenswood City School District's proposal to build upwards the upwards of 90 affordable homes on the flood school site. This would prioritize, which would prioritize staff and educators. Uh, and, and in addition, the revenue generated by these homes would help bring educator salaries in line with the surrounding uh, districts. Um, at the end of the day, we all want the opportunity to thrive, to be able to plan for the future and more importantly, position our children for success in their own lives. Um, we cannot do this if our teachers and district staff do not have access to a safe and stable place to call home. Um, this proposal allows them to be near their place of work. This reduces the amount of time spent on the road and reallocating that time to this community, which would be to provide a quality education to Menlo Park students. We support these homes on the flood school site and we urge the city of Mundo Park to do so as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Renee Spooner followed by Ruth Shetter. Good evening, it's Renee Spooner. 
I am wondering why during the presentation we did not hear more about the city's impression of the environmental um, justice element to site 38 and the, the former flood school site. Um, I believe that uh, Jenny and Eric both mentioned that this particular parcel of land is directly against the sound wall of Highway 101. L literally, it is right there. And if the parcel was deemed inappropriate and unfit for living for a preschool or an actual school or a daycare center, then how is it possible for it to be fit for up to 90 or 100 families living there? If the air isn't quality and, and, and clean enough for people to go to school there or have a daycare center there, then how is it okay to allow people to be housed there in numbers if there are issues with the um, air and sound pollution? So we, there are many of us in Suburban Park who do support housing for low-income folks. Um, we're also interested in understanding how many teachers or families or staff from the Ravenswood School District are actually interested or planning to move onto this site, knowing that their children cannot go to school in Menlo Park, that they're for some reason would be contracted to only go to school across the freeway uh, to the Ravenswood City School District. Um, so my, my request and my statement is to please listen to the folks who live immediately adjacent to this site and allow us to um, have some true conversations with you about environmental justice and the societal justice of having people, as Eric said, segregated from the rest of us because of the way this parcel of land is being used. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Ruth Shatter, followed by Curtis Evans. Um, hi, it's Schechter, by the way. Um, I bought my house in Suburban Park 25 years ago. I was planning to uh, stay here for two years, but the neighborhood was so wonderful that we have stayed here for two and a half decades. Um, I understand the need for housing. I really understand the pressures that the city is under to um, provide affordable housing, to uh, that Ravenswood School District really needs some uh, housing for their staff and, and teachers. I really understand these multiple pressures. What I'm not understanding is um, the kind of tone deaf approach to building such a large, dense, um, high, essentially a high rise for Menlo Park in essentially a cul-de-sac. The approach that is being taken feels like you are undermining the tenor of a community because of politics and money and pressure from a developer. I feel very strongly that, that we do need housing and I, I would embrace housing at a smaller scale um, without being four stories tall in a neighborhood of maximum two stories that, that access is thought about in a different way. Right now, it seems like there's only one way in and out of this uh, development, which will eliminate the ability of kids to play on the street, which they do now. Um, traffic used to be uh, quite difficult when the school was there. But at that time, most of the parents dropped their kids off through Flood Park. We only got some cars going in and out, but even that kind of affected the neighborhood. There were people just zipping in and out, but that was only in the mornings and when they were picking up their kids. Now you're talking about upwards of 90 
people, meaning at minimum 90 cars a day going in and out on a, on a, what had been a quiet, what has been a quiet street. I feel like you are um, looking at this in a way that is dramatically changing the tenor of our neighborhood. And I am very strongly against the density and the height of, of what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Curtis Evans, followed by Catherine C. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to let me share my experience of living in Menlo Park, specifically for the past 30 years. When I was looking to buy a home back in 1991, I looked in for many homes in the surrounding areas as well as suburban park. The charm of this neighborhood kept drawing me back here every time I drove through the neighborhood. There would be children playing in the streets, neighbors visiting outdoors as well as families walking through the streets. After 30 years, the character of this neighborhood has not changed. I can assure you that I am very much in favor of affordable housing, but not to the detriment of our neighborhoods that we have come to love. Not only do I live on Hedge Road, but I also live very close to the flood site 38. And I can tell you firsthand that when the school was open on this site, there were cars constantly speeding down the streets. Cars would park in front of my home and dump garbage. There were police reports of speeding almost on a weekly basis. There are those who will tell you that whatever the impact is on neighborhoods like ours, it must be done, but I cannot support this logic. As a resident of this neighborhood, we should be able to expect that our streets remain safe for children and our families. We simply do not have the infrastructure to support a 90 plus apartment building to be built at that site. There are only two access roads that feed the apartment building. Our streets are fairly narrow and cars can barely pass each other as it is. Not only is the safety a major concern, but congestion is also a real factor. Prior to COVID, getting out of our neighborhood to the freeway access approximately only one mile away could take up to 30 minutes during rush hour. Bay Road is the only access to either Willow or Marsh Road, and these are the only two roads to 101 from Suburban Park. I am a contractor and for a living, which puts me all over the Bay Area. Bay Area. It is almost non-existent to see children playing in the streets these days. I love to see young people outdoors riding bikes, playing in the streets, able to safely visit friends in our neighborhood. I feel this type of high density structure would completely change the beauty of this neighborhood. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Catherine Z, followed by Karen Grove. Hi, um, my name is Kat C. I wanted to call in support of teacher housing at the flood site owned by the Ravenswood School District. I am a former high school math and science teacher and a former resident of Menlo Park who had to move away because of the high cost of living and general lack of housing options for a younger working person like me. Um, when teachers have to live with you know, a two hour a day commute, we arrive tired. We don't have that extra time or energy to spend with the kids who are struggling. Um, we're not able to relate to the kids and their parents as neighbors. And ultimately we're more likely to quit for a job uh, closer to where we live. And we see that with teacher turnover being high in places like the Ravenswood School District. Uh, if we were able to live in teacher housing such as this one and skip that long commute, we would come to school refreshed. We would have extra energy and time to spend with the kids. Uh, we are likely to remain in our jobs, and we might even have time to tutor students in the surrounding flood park neighborhoods. Teachers and most young professionals, we cannot afford the current $3 million price tag of the average home in Menlo Park. So the city needs to build housing for people that can make it run and the people who are teaching our children. I grew up here and I cannot afford to live here anymore and neither will your children when they grow up. And if we continue to block housing production in Menlo Park, this is gonna stay the same. 
I would also like to remind everyone, citing the environmental aspects uh, of this, that housing insecurity is an environmental justice issue. And inclusion, I think that the flood park site is a great place to add the housing that we so desperately need. Uh, and I really hope that you will support this development. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Karen Grove, followed by Adina Levin. Hi there, I am Karen Grove. I am, I don't know, a retired housing commissioner of Menlo Park. Um, so I'm a resident of Menlo Park and I strongly support this project. I am so grateful and excited that Ravenswood City School District has developed these plans um, for their property, um, which happens to be a Menlo Park. It's a win-win-win. Um, the first win is that it is, their plan is to develop it as 100% affordable housing, which is amazing because we in Menlo Park have to plan for 1500 affordable units. And that is really hard to do. One of the best ways to do it is on public land. So thank you Ravenswood City School District for this proposal. The second and the second reason other than us achieving our a compliant housing element is that it would be producing affordable housing, um, which is sorely needed in Menlo Park and throughout the community. And the third reason is that it will support the Ravenswood City School District. It's gonna provide a modest one to 2% of their budget form of sustainable revenue for a school district that has been disinvested through a lot of government decisions throughout the years. Um, and that's super important for people in general, for, uh, just based on principle, but it's also important because a lot of Menlo Park children go to school in the Ravenswood City School District. So it's just an amazing design project. I totally support it. And I hope that others will too. This is like super strategy, big yes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Adina Levin, followed by Bob, Bob Egg McGrew. I'd just like to note that we have about 20 speakers left uh, with their hands raised. So if folks can please limit your comments uh, to between one to two minutes. That will ensure that we give everyone an opportunity to speak this evening. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. The next speaker was Adina Levin, followed by Bob McGrew. Go ahead, Adina. Uh, hello, um, good evening, um, staff and consultants. My name is Adina Levin. I am a Menlo Park resident, and I am strongly in support of the affordable housing for teachers and uh, school employees um, to uh, live on this site. I was really happy to hear Kat Z's comments um, with the voice of uh, uh, people who will benefit from having a home that is near uh, where they work and particularly uh, people who support uh, the um, uh, uh, students and people who, who support our, our schools. Um, and I wanted to, uh, first of all, um, share a little personal story. Um, one of the first things I did in um, getting civically involved in Menlo Park shortly after I moved here was when uh, Menlo Park was doing a housing element for the first time. And um, the housing element involves um, zoning for housing at different affordability levels. And what happened during that housing element is that um, there were meetings um, neighborhood by neighborhood and um, they these meetings came to wealthier neighborhoods in Menlo Park and people were in those neighborhoods were able to knock out all the housing sites until almost all of the sites for housing and affordable housing um, were located in District 1, the formerly redlined area of Menlo Park. And um, uh, this time around, the state has uh, new requirements to affirmatively further fair housing, which means having housing in areas around the city, um, especially in high opportunity areas. Um, 
And so I do think that it is a, a following the goals of this, the state and the goals of our city to have homes for people of all income levels all around the city. Um, I was uh, recently on, uh, just termed out of the Complete Streets Commission. And um, there are some circulation issues um, for this site that I hope that the city and the county uh, uh, do address. And I think that those are things that we should look at addressing them rather than to use as a rationale to not have needed homes on this site. And um, several people mentioned um, the fact that there is a bus that's only serving school hours. That sounds like a great idea to be able to include this on a bus route or city shuttle route that serves uh, more uh, times of the day. So we should solve the transportation problems and welcome people living in affordable homes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Bob McGrew, followed by Susan Arrington. Hi, my name is Bob McGrew, and I am a decade-long Menlo Park resident. I strongly support the use of this site as affordable housing for teachers. The Bay Area has a terrible housing crisis. I have seen too many of my friends leave the peninsula and the Bay Area over the last decade because there's too little housing for them to find a place to live that they can afford. Teachers are not high income professionals, but it's still important to give them the opportunity to have homes near where they work. No site is perfect, but it is important to allow housing anyway. Let me repeat that, no site is perfect, but we need to allow housing anyway. We have very, very few other opportunities with a parcel this size to provide 100% affordable housing in Menlo Park. And in this case, we're able to support the teachers of students who live in our city. I strongly support the use of this parcel's affordable housing. It would be a terrible shame if we let this opportunity go to waste. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Susan Arrington, followed by Julie Wong. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, and um, I am curious, why nobody's taking notes. I only see three things on there and that doesn't really encompass everything that's been said. So with that, I am a teacher in Menlo Park. My husband is also in the Menlo Park City School District. We have been in Suburban Park for 15 years. My biggest thing is, is that there's a discrepancy between what you guys are saying and I don't know what's going on. We have 90 units for staff and educators from Ravenswood, and yet we have up to 270 units of affordable housing. Which is it? What are we talking about? Uh, the other thing is, I'm very concerned. If you're thinking about the fact that uh, we can't even have a daycare center, then to have a high rise against a freeway, a sound wall is not acceptable. I would say that I am for affordable housing. I am for it for teachers and staff and educators of Ravenswood School District. How many units? That is my problem and I'm not quite sure what's going on in terms of the 270 versus 92 versus 20. And my other concern is I get the bus issue um, that you can fix it. I, I do not think that Menlo Park will allow adults on the same bus as our middle schoolers in terms of um, going to school. The other thing is I wanted to say is public safety. Um, the rushing through our, our, our neighborhoods is not acceptable and I'm not sure how to curb that. The other thing is what do we do if you're gonna build a big site? What do we do about a fire? If a fire engine with a ladder cannot make it to the site? Um, I encourage you to make this a single family 
all affordable housing, 27 units or whatever it is for teachers and staff of Ravenswood and nothing more. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Julie Wong, followed by Heather Hopkins. And I'd just like to remind folks that we have about 20 other people joining this call that would like to provide their comments. So if you can please limit your comments to between one to two minutes, that will give everyone an opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you. And go ahead, Julie. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, and I thank Susan Arrington for touching on one of my questions, which was how many uh, staff and teachers were expected to occupy the site actually. Um, uh, I, I had some of the same questions about the what the total number of proposed units was going to be. And also I would like to ask if it's possible that Sheridan Drive and or parts of Hedge Road would be widened in order to support egress uh, to this site? Or if, could there possibly, are, are there other options for entry into the site? Thank you for your comment. Calvin? Yes. Uh, this, this is Jeff. Um, Maybe we could maybe we could take a pause here, um, and we've had we've had thirteen uh, speakers, and we've recorded several uh, questions on the screen here. All of us are are furiously taking notes on everything that is said uh, by all of the speakers, and that will be well well documented in the materials uh, that are that are come out of this meeting and, and are used in in uh, further meetings with the Planning Commission, the Housing Commission, the City Council. But for, the, for this meeting to make sure we answered uh, questions that came up, that's what the, that's what the whiteboard on the, on the screen is. And so we wanted to pause uh, periodically and answer these, uh, attempt to answer these in, in, in uh, batches so people could get uh, feedback um, on the questions that, that they've have taken the time to voice. So I'd like to um, do that now and I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll pull on um, some of the staff resources here on, on some of these topics, but wanted to acknowledge uh, the questions we have from from the, from the from the people that have spoken. And uh, a lot of speakers have rightly um, asked the question in different ways: uh, what What is the city thinking, and the and the people working on this project? What are they thinking about the environmental justice issues uh, that we're all becoming more and more aware of? Um, in terms of location of housing uh, in areas that, that may have environmental constraints, uh, loc location of, of housing that meets uh, some of the new fair housing uh, requirements that were mentioned uh, by, the, by the state, uh, that, that affordable housing in particular be located in areas that have good access to um, a, a variety of, of amen amenities and such. And the other, um, so the, the response to that is, the team definitely takes all those factors into very, very, very careful consideration. Um, and then there's, there's also the need to acknowledge that there's only a very limited number of, of vacant sites uh, in, in the city that has been mentioned uh, within the entire draft housing plan as it exists now. There's only, there's only two vacant sites actually. There's this site and then another uh, smaller site owned by uh, Stanford away over on the other end of town in District 5. All the other sites uh, have developed uses on them, which in and of themselves are considered impediments to development during the eight year planning period. So vacant sites are uh, very rare. Uh, there's not that many of them left, obviously, on the peninsula within the cities. And so that does, that does raise this site uh, to, to extra consideration for, for housing. Additionally, one of our um, real focus strategies within the housing element sites analysis overall was, was to focus on publicly owned sites because there's been a strong track record uh, within the peninsula of many, many of the uh, strongly affordable housing that is produced is produced in partnership uh, with public agencies that, that control the land uh, resource. So it's a balancing act, as one of the speakers said, there's no perfect. There's no perfect sites out there, but on balance, we feel that this 
this site, uh, many of the environmental justice issues such as air quality and noise uh, can be mitigated with modern construction techniques and modern uh, building codes and other issues can be can be adapted to. Uh, in terms of process, I think there was a very good question about well, why are the numbers um, all over the place? There's really two different things going on. The first thing uh, is obviously the city is in the process of updating its uh, housing element. And the city has identified um, this site based on its own, own criteria, uh, based on the facts on the ground, uh, the nature of the site, the ownership, the location. Um, and it's it's then the city's taking a hard look at it. Separately from that, um, the school district is doing its own planning uh, for its its surplus land resources, and talking to uh, folks who can help them in the, in that mission. We're really focused on the housing element uh, policy part of it, uh, but it is an indicator of that um, the strategy has merit. Is obviously the the public agency is taking their own independent steps, uh, looking at uh, affordable housing on this site. But the real focus for us at, at this at this point is at the at the at the policy level of the uh, appropriateness of the site as an opportunity site, the appropriateness of uh, different density uh, considerations uh, for the site. And so all of your input will be be helpful for that. No 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 final decisions have been made on this site. Some of the other uh, questions. Um, how does it fit for families uh, when it's not okay for a school? Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to research that more and get more information on that. Uh, we don't know how many teachers and staff uh, would be interested in this site. Uh, that's something that could possibly uh, come out later. Um, could Sheridan Drive and, and Hedge Road be, be widened? That's something we could um, we could discuss with our our colleagues in the public public works department to look at that. Um, other entry options, I know um, the city is, is looking at partnering and communicating with both the school district, uh, the county um, and adjacent properties to look at additional access points, uh, either for regular vehicle traffic or for, or for emergency access. Um, and so, hey, Deanna, is there anything um, you would like to add to the, the questions on the screen or from your or from your own notes? I think you've covered it. I think that's good. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Calvin, you want to um, yes take it back with this with the speakers? Thanks, Jeff, for that summary and overview. We have about 21 hands um, that are still raised. And so I'll continue calling on these comments and thanks for all the participation. I'd also like to remind folks that this will be our last call for public comments. So please raise your hand at this time if you wanna speak and we'll jot you down and call on you. And please also remember to, if you can, please limit your comments to between one to two minutes, just so that we can ensure everyone has an opportunity to provide their feedback this evening. So now I'll call on the next speaker. The next speaker will be Heather Hopkins, followed by Kathleen Daly. Hi there. Thank you for holding this community input session. My name is Heather Hopkins, and I serve on the board of the Los Alamitos Elementary School District. But I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Community Equity Collaborative, which is a Menlo Park-based nonprofit that focuses on educational equity on the San Francisco Bay Peninsula. I'm also speaking on behalf of my local preschool, Toddle, which I've owned since 2015. I'm calling tonight in support of Ravenswood proposal. Our region is having a severe housing crisis. And as a preschool owner and school board member, I can say with certainty that this housing crisis has caused a huge shortage of educators in our classrooms. The addition of up to 90 new units on this parcel will not only help relieve this demand, it will also provide a, a really much needed source of revenue for one of the three school districts serving elementary school students in Menlo Park. Uh, I recently did some local research about the history of redlining and its impact on schools in our area. Um, Menlo Park unfortunately has a well-documented history of discriminatory housing policies and practices that have directly caused a lack of resources flowing to Ravenswood since the 1950s. 
and supporting this development at the proposed density, um, but those of us who live west of 101, uh, supporting them will bring some long overdue equity to the students of Bell Haven, which is part of Menlo Park and East Palo Alto. Our schools and property values have benefited from this redlining for over 70 years. And it's time to put our needs aside and support the school district and its students. I would be happy to have a similar project in my neighborhood. Thanks so much. Thanks for your comment. Next speaker is Kathleen Daly, followed by Devra Moeller. Hello, and thank you. Um, I wanna just um, thank the last speaker. Um, I think she brought up a very important point in all of these discussions, and that is the history of redlining and the reason why there might be a Ravenswood district and a Willows district and a Menlo Park district. There are things that um, this community definitely needs to address. I don't live in Menlo Park, but I spend a fair amount of time in Menlo Park with my business. I've had the absolute joy of working with the Ravenswood School District for many years, and I'm struggling to understand how one can assume that all these horrible things are going to happen to the neighborhood when the Ravenswood District hasn't even had a full opportunity to plan out this entire project how many stories, what's really gonna work. It, it's my understanding that that's the first thing that needs to happen. So before anyone decides that it should not happen, why, don't, why, do, you, why do you assume that you already are gonna hate it? I don't understand how we're talking about teachers, um, staff, people that work in a school environment, caring, tending, educating, feeding our youth. Don't they deserve a place to live? Who said they're gonna be horrible drivers tearing down your streets and ruining neighborhoods. Um, it, it just, some of these comments, as much as I wanna help understand or, or understand why people are so concerned about their neighborhoods, lots of changes have happened in neighborhoods over many years, especially in the last five or 10 years. And working together, communicating, um, we, things can get done. There are different ways for teachers to get out of that neighborhood, use the Ringwood, bridge across 101. Bellhaven Elementary is right on the other side. The Boys and Girls Club is right on the other side. Who's to say we can't sh get shuttle buses, e-bikes, all kinds of things. Teachers deserve a place to live. Staff deserves a place to live. It doesn't matter if they're serving lunch, they're the janitor, they're the principal. It doesn't matter. These are the people that have our kids' future in their hands. And it just, I wish just People would just understand, let them plan it out. Let's see what happens. Work with together with them, those in the neighborhood that are so concerned and try to build something that works for everyone, but especially the people that deserve it the most. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Deborah Moeller, followed by a speaker name with Roma. Hi, my name is Deborah Moeller. I live on Hedge Road and I have two questions for you. Um, first, in your description of the plan, I didn't hear any mention of an assessment of traffic impact or uh, access for safety vehicles, etc. I'm wondering where, if at all, in the process you do that assessment and is it done by professionals with uh, expertise in traffic management? And then the second question I have is that um, I've heard that Ravenswood might put in its contract something or uh, a preference for a 90 unit max cap. And I'm wondering how enforceable that cap would be um, or how enforceable that would be once the developer has the uh, signed agreement. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Roma, followed by uh, speaker name Nicole. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, if this is Gary, Roma is my wife. I would like to put some numbers to the narrowness of the streets. The street width, which is uh, Hedge Road is 24 feet wide. The, v, the largest, the, in California, you can have eight, eight and a half feet wide vehicles. So two of them parked opposite each other on a street makes up 17 of that 24 feet and leaves you a whole seven feet left for anything to get in between. 
So it makes it really difficult. This becomes one lane for small cars any time that there's any building going on in the neighborhood. Fire trucks in California can, I don't, can be up to 10 feet wide. So the problem that we have in Suburban Park is not so much that you're gonna build something out there as emergency vehicles that would have to get there to fight a fire would require a ladder truck. And it just, if there was any vehicles parked along the street, it would be almost impossible for it to get in. Um, I've lived in here for 48 years. I'm out every day walking my dog and there are kids all the time, bicycles, scooters, jogging in the streets. And the people that live in this neighborhood, there's not very much traffic and everybody drives slow. But when we did have the uh, magnet school and I was all for the magnet school, we had a lot of people charging through this neighborhood like crazy. And when you put a whole, you put a couple hundred cars there, they're all trying to get out, all trying to get over to their jobs in uh, District 1. They're going to have, they're all about going to be going out at the same time, trying to make a left hand turn on a one lane road. It's just, it's just really upsetting to see that kind of thing happen. If I don't think anybody would be upset if they could do it and get egress through Flood Park. It's the traffic that really has people upset because this is really a quiet, walkable neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker will be Nicole, followed by Mary Roselle. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I've heard a lot of people on this call talking about how, you know, we need more affordable housing and we need more teacher housing. And as a resident of Suburban Park, I just want to make clear that, you know, the vast majority of people living in Suburban Park agree. I agree. Um, we need more affordable housing. It's not fair for teachers to have to drive for two to three hours to get to work. What we want is something that provides for housing, especially for teachers and affordable housing for teachers at that flood school site, but does it in a way that isn't going to destroy our neighborhood. And people have said, oh, how do you know it's going to have a negative impact on your neighborhood? There's 45 houses between the point where that one road is that would lead from Bay Road to that site. And the proposal is to add anywhere between 78 to 260 units at that site. So it's going to increase traffic exponentially. And that's a safety issue when you're on a street where there's kids constantly running in the street, riding their bikes, playing on scooters, doing chalk drawings, people walking their dogs. It's a very foot heavy neighborhood. So I just want to make clear, like we are not against housing. None of us are. We want housing at that site, but it should be a density that is responsible and balanced and doesn't destroy the surrounding community. And Somebody said that there's 1,500 affordable housing units that the city needs to, to meet. That number is actually 991. Um, somebody also said there's, there's very few parcels, um, opportunity sites that, that can achieve that. There's, if you take out this site, there's still over 8,000 potential units identified um, as, as potential units in the housing element draft or plan or you know with the December staff report that you guys um, published. So there are plenty of places that, that units can be built. Um, and they don't all have to get shoved into this one particular site in order to meet those, those allocations. Um, and to do so would be irresponsible and there should be a balance. You add units that this, the infrastructure and neighboring communities can support. And so that's what we're asking, not to destroy our neighborhood, add housing there, please do stuff that, that supports housing, give them subsidies, give them exemptions, give them whatever they want to add some housing there that would make it pencil, but also do it in a way where it's not some huge, highly dense project that would destroy our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Mary Rizzo, followed by Ron Snow. 
Hi, um, I live in um, the suburban park neighborhood and have been here for many decades, um, just like the rest of the neighbors. And I could not agree with, you know, Nicole anymore and Deborah and Gary, AKA Roma. Um, we all have lived here for many years. Um, most of us have actually lived here during the time that the school in the Ravenswood School District was around and we experienced the, the traffic and luckily the traffic was only during school hours. Um, unfortunately, with this big project um, that could potentially have up to 260 units, you know, the numbers that's coming out of here is astounding. If it's 260 units at a max, um, and that would propose probably one car per household, but most people have two cars. So that would potentially be 520 cars coming down Hedge Road out of Sheridan. So I completely agree with everyone else that we do want um, affordable housing. We want teachers to have affordable housing. We want housing equity, but we also want transparency. We want um, accountability, and we really want a neighborhood traffic survey and not just that, but just a safety survey too, through the streets, through Suburban Park, and also down through Bay Road and adjacent streets, because obviously the this 500, this additional 520 cars is not just going to be inundating our neighborhood, it's going to be inundating the side of Mental Park. Um, so I will just end it there. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Ron Snow, followed by David Jones. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Ron Snow, and I live in Menlo Park. Um, I there's a couple of key points that I I think are are not being discussed. One one is a school district just generally isn't in the real estate business, and in order and and there's an economic aspect that that I haven't been able to discover on uh, on the whole business aspect of this, which is if you're going to have affordable affordable housing, uh, and this is a, you know, 60 million, it, well, it's into the, I, I heard all sorts of different numbers. So the cost of this development uh, and the cost of upkeep, and in a decade or two, the sea level rise issues that are gonna cause extra costs for this particular property, don't equate to the school district actually making money. Uh, the only way you can make money is to not have affordable housing and charge market rate or something close to market rate. And that comes back to not really helping the teachers. And as far as equity on the, on the housing side of things, um, <clears throat> people that would like to be in affordable housing often have other uh, standard of living challenges like uh, transportation, access to market, uh, you know, um, retail stores and things like that. And this site doesn't provide really anything that enables a person to live there without having to drive somewhere. Uh, the other point is that people have talked about the number of cars coming in, uh, that there's really a multiple to that because for every household there, there's an Amazon delivery truck or a FedEx delivery truck or a cleaning lady or cleaning man. Um, there's a uh, maintenance, there's uh, utility trucks, there's all sorts of other additional trucks and uh, cars that are servicing that uh, neighborhood or that housing project. And so that it's really a multiple, it's not just one or two cars per family, it's, it's really a multiple of traffic that's going to be hitting upon that, especially during the day. The other thing is, is that it's sort of, uh, it's hard to fight the influence of a multi-million dollar developer. Their whole um, lobbying effort is going to be to make this thing a development, not necessarily always being on the, on the side of what makes the best sense for the community, but probably more on the side of what makes the most profit for the developer. And so I'd, I hope that someone's taking a look and making sure that things are okay on that side. Uh, the other, what, the last point I wanted to make was, we have thousands of units going in, um, being developed and made available in the Menlo Park and San Mateo County area around here. And we're getting way out of balance in the sense of 
what goes with housing and standard of living is green space. And uh, Flood Park is right there, but that's the only, um, um, well, I shouldn't say the only, um, that's, a, that's a, 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 an opportunity for Flood Park to actually provide green space uh, with this property. If it were to be used as green space, the school district would leave its options open and would not have to uh, tie itself into a 90 year lease or a, an extended lease. Um, it could be green space and in 10 years, it could be reevaluated in 20 years it could be reevaluated. So I think um, we, we need affordable housing. Nobody I think is denying that there's better places for it. And we need to include green space when we're expanding thousands of units in the, in the uh, community, we need to have additional green space and I think this park, I mean, this area should be used for that green space. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be David Jones, followed by Katie Baruzzi. I have in my notes, we have about 19 more speakers left. So again, I remind folks to please limit your comments to between one to two minutes to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. I'll now turn it over to David. Hi, this is Leslie. I'm actually Dave's wife. Um, so Suburban Park is a neighborhood of 244 homes. So putting up a 90 to 260 unit apartment building um, can potentially outsize the, the size of our current neighborhood. Hedge Road, as of now, the only proposed access is narrower than typical streets, um, the way Gary said. And I, I'm strongly in support of affordable housing. I am completely and totally opposed to this project. You know, we rented a house um, in a neighborhood on a busy street for years. And we knew when it came time to raise children, we wanted to live in a safe neighborhood with minimal traffic. And we worked two, three jobs we saved for years. And we finally found our little house in Suburban Park and our children learn how to ride bikes in the streets. We have elderly neighbors walking their walkers. People walk their dogs, kids are on scooters, playing ball, throwing football. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm completely opposed. Building you know, the, a 90 to 260 unit apartment complex will permanently and irreversibly destroy the safety of our streets. So thank you, that's all. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Katie Barusi, followed by Jim Van Beekle. Hi, uh, it's Katie Baruzzi. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I live on the corner of Bay and Ringwood, so I see a fair amount of traffic. And I'm also quite familiar um, with the school site um, and its adjacency to Flood Park, um, to Suburban Park, and to Haven House. Um, I think it's interesting that um, we're not really talking much about Haven House in this conversation because um, it's a transitional housing place with apartments for people who are transitioning out of um, homelessness. Um, including families, and you know, is it optimally close to all of the services and amenities that we desire? No, um, but we built it there probably for a reason, which is that the land was um, affordable and it was not the worst option. And it is housing people and has been housing people and helping people transition for a long time now. Um, so I just want to um, keep people and keep that in mind. Um, as I've been on the Complete Streets Commission, um, speaking for myself, I'll just talk a little bit about streets and access and comment that um, every time I go to Europe on vacation, which I know a lot of other people do, which sounds incredibly privileged and entitled, I marvel at the ways in which narrow streets can be full of life and can support density. Um, you know, you go to cities like Paris and it's, you know, on every side, you know, the housing is, is three or four stories tall, if not more. Um, and yet the streets are certainly not any wider than Hedge Road, in a lot of cases narrower. Um, uh, somebody had asked about widening streets um, to make it safer, and that's actually the wrong direction. I think Hugh Louch is on the line and might be able to tell people a little bit of what we know about speeding and traffic calming. But actually, um, what you want to do is, is the opposite. If you want safe streets where that are people sized, where people can, can play and ride bikes and interact, um, you don't want to make them wide because that induces speeding and and um, so I hope that we don't consider that. Um, in general, I'll say um, 
I think a lot of people have made great points. Um, yeah, this is public land and below market rate housing is a phenomenal use of public land. Um, we have a long wait list of people looking for below market rate housing. We have teachers who are commuting two and three hours to get to school. Um, our, the teachers in the Ravenswood district are not compensated nearly as well right now as teachers in the Menlo Parks Public Schools district. Um, and right now what's available to them in terms of rentals is pretty slim pickings. So, you know, if the school district believes that they have um, faculty and employees that would use this site, um, I believe them. Um, and I cannot think of a better use for it. I absolutely agree that we need to support diverse um, means of access. Um, and I think uh, we can all learn and grow together as we figure this out. Um, but my final point is actually is about context. Um, we're looking at this one site right now, but really our problem as a community to solve is where? Where should the below market rate housing go? I've heard so many people say, um, I support affordable housing, but, and, and, but not here. And so my question is where? I mean, I want you to contend with the maps and the land costs and the availability of lots or lack of availability of lots and the numbers and how they do or don't pencil out. And I think if everybody were actually earnestly contending with that problem, instead of the problem of, I want my kid to be able to play hopscotch on the street without somebody from an apartment driving by and possibly hurting them. I think if people were contending with the bigger picture problem, um, the fact that we have people living on the streets in addition to people playing on the streets in the same town, no less, then um, that's, that's where I'm hoping that as a community, we can put our energies. Look at the big picture, figure out where we fit all these sites, whether it's 900 or 1500 or 2000, somewhere we need to fit below market rate housing. This is one of the few places in our community right now where it can pencil out. One of the few sites that's actually amenable to being redeveloped now. Um, and, and let's just work together and try to make that possible um, for as many families as we can logically serve here. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Jim Van Vigel, followed by um, a Zoom username with AH. Hey, Calvin, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Cool, thanks. Yeah, my name is Jim Van Vigel. Uh, I live in Suburban Park. Thanks for arranging this and considering our input. Um, my parents were both teachers and I, I feel teachers are often underserved. Um, I would definitely support additional housing at the flood site at the currently zoned density. I'm very concerned about the proposed density considering the, the single access through suburban park. There, there are about 50 homes along the path from Bay Road to the entrance on Sheridan. And um, despite all the potential traffic mitigations people have, have mentioned, I, I think it's safe to assume you double the homes, you more or less double the traffic. And the proposed density, it sounds like, would, would nearly triple the homes and, and presumably the traffic. So I, I think this is a, a, a very critical safety issue for, for the kids. And to me, that is the biggest picture, the most important picture to me is, is the safety here. At, at, at the risk of sounding dramatic, I, I think this could be a, a life or death issue for the kids in this neighborhood. And I know additional access points are being researched, but I haven't seen any guarantees that they will exist. So I, I realize it may take time and, and not be easy to get those guarantees, but when it, when it comes to the safety of my family and the neighborhood kids, I'm, I'm not gonna accept anything less. So I, I guess a question, Kelvin, to you to note here is not just are there any other entry options, but how can we guarantee there are other entries before any development moves forward? Um, and and to, I think it was uh, Kathleen's point earlier about in, in engaging, you know, we, we should have conversations and, and totally agree. Um, another question, Kelvin, is what are the mechanisms to reduce the number of units to something that maybe we are all comfortable with? Because I, I hear a lot of people talking at maximums and, and minimums. So, so I'm curious, what are the right forums to get to a number that maybe more people could support? Um, so finally, just, yeah, please prioritize the, the safety and ensure additional access paths are created. Um, thanks, thanks for your time. And I hope if 
if something's developed that it can be done so in a, a way that helps the teachers and staff um, while maintaining the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Zoom username AH, followed by a speaker with Zoom username L Simons. Hi, thank you very much for um, hosting this meeting and letting everybody have a chance to have their voice be heard, uh, regardless of what their you know uh, voice says. Um, I spoke with the senior director for at the Institute of Transportation Engineers who estimated that this project will generate up to 1100 additional car trips per day on a weekday. And you guys keep saying that you're looking into alternative access points and I'd like to know what exactly that means, because as I understand it. Neither the city nor Ravenswood can mandate that the developer put in another access point so. I'm wondering, is there a scenario under which this project could be built with shared and being the only access point for non emergency vehicles. Um, and then I had a question for Jeff uh, in the not too distant past, I think it was February. Uh, one of the meetings you publicly spoke out against including R1 parcels in the housing element process um, saying. And I quote it's an unspoken assumption um, unquote not to touch them and to do so would quote un be moving the needle significantly unquote. So I'm wondering what has changed in the last like two months uh, based on that statement you made in February. Um, that's all, thank you very much. Calvin, it looks like we've had about 11 speakers since we last took a break for short questions. Sounds good, Jeff. I'm sorry, do you want to do a, a quick recap? Yes, thank you. So since last time we've heard questions about um, assessment of traffic impact, who's, who is gonna do that? Uh, what are their qualifications? Um, what's the scale of that analysis? Um, preference for 90 unit max, how enforceable would that be? Uh, the recent speaker spoke to what, what are the guarantees, if any, to require or provide for additional entries uh, to the to the site, uh, what are the mechanisms uh, to limit units? And the last question I'll, I'll take first, because um, that's a very interesting topic um, that a AH raised about the R1 issue, which I believe was back in um, March or May of, of uh, last year, where we kicked off this project with the city council. And there was a, a very good discussion about what was on the table, what was off the table. Um, and I made the I made the statement that in my professional opinion as a planner, it wouldn't serve the city uh, to go in and, and rezone uh, single family uh, residences, single family parcels um, for as opportunity sites under the idea that you would draw, draw a boundary around six, 12 or 20, um, single family homes and call it a call it a housing opportunity site. And in that context, I was literally talking about um, single family parcels that had single family homes on them. This obviously is has a zoning of R1, but it is in fact a vacant uh, school site. It has never been um, developed with single family homes in, in the past, as far as as far as we know at this point. And so that that's the that's the big distinction, and I hope I hope that um, responds well to your to your question because I do um, I do stand by the original idea that um, trying to convert uh, single family homes to a higher density housing is is um, is is just simply not not effective, and the st the state has sort of taken over that debate by passing SB9, which allows for a form of intensification when, um, when homeowners wanna let's put their lot and build uh, another house or two or four. So that, that debate has kind of shifted, um, but regardless, I still think it's a, it's a valid approach when trying to do these housing elements on, on, the, on the, the strict deadlines we have. Uh, with that, I'd like to 
um, uh, sort of set the stage on that on the housing, excuse me, on the transportation analysis question. So that really has two parts. I'll, I'll talk about it at the housing element level. There is an EIR in, in progress uh, being done by um, ESA, a uh, very well respected Bay Area environmental consulting firm. Uh, they in turn have engaged with Hexagon uh, traffic engineers in San Jose, and they will do a programmatic analysis of all the all the traffic coming out of the proposed housing element plan. Um, the letter that was written by the by the community on the, of interest in this site uh, specifically requested that their concerns be forwarded to the environmental impact analysis team. So we have done that. And so they, they know about the, the concerns around this site and the and the constraints with the with the with the single point of access. Um, so that's kind of at the housing element level. And then I'd like to ask the deputy public works uh, director to talk a little bit how any project city has not received a development application, as Tom Smith mentioned at the beginning. There's no no formal application on file from the from the school district or from any developer on this site. But once, you know, if an application does come in, the city would have its, a process to evaluate that through the development review process. Sure, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and again, Hugh Louch, the Assistant Public Works Director for Transportation. Um, you know, as Jeff said, when we get applications, uh, we do conduct a thorough review um, and we also, uh, do typically hire consultants much in the way uh, Jeff has just mentioned to conduct those reviews of the potential transportation impacts. Uh, and there are a few different types of analyses that, that happen as part of that. So part of it is the circulation uh, for the site itself. Then we also look at um, as required, uh, how much traffic overall it's gonna produce. And then uh, in the city, we have general plan policy that we use to look at the potential impacts on the way vehicles travel on our street network. So we look at all these different levels of how transportation would work for a particular development. Um, and again, without a particular uh, application in, it's really it's impossible really to comment on what that would look like in this specific case and what would it would mean in terms of the street network that exists today. Uh, but we are you know, reviewing and, and hearing from folks and trying to get ahead of that as much as, uh, as time allows. Um, and then if it, an application were to come in, we would be uh, responding to that and, and conducting those analyses as part of that process. Thanks, you. And then the next question is a pre preference for 90 unit max. Um, how unfortunate would that be? Deanna, would you like to like to speak to that about um, how the how the how the housing element would would create a framework to think about density on this site? Sure. So that there are a couple of different things that we are. Uh, discussing here. So we're talking at the housing element level where we're looking at uh, potentially changing the general plan and potentially changing the zoning, which would set the sort of outer limit of the number of units. Uh, there are other um, ideas that we're also exploring, as uh, was mentioned, the affordable housing overlay. There are other state density bonus laws that could potentially come into play. There are existing um, below market rate density bonuses that the city already currently has. So there are different, um, there are uh, other mechanisms that also affect the density. I think this particular question um, was in reference to a specific development that the school district uh, may be considering is uh, with, with an applicant. Um, and so the school district, I believe, um, maybe in conversations about limiting the number of units um, that may be separate from what the zoning may allow, um, if I understood what that, that particular comment was. And so um, I, I can see if the city attorney has anything further else to say, but I, I think that would be a private agreement between the school district and uh, a developer on, on the number of units um, in the city um, would, not be, would not necessarily be part of that. We would process a project that would come forward um, but we would uh, 
and, and make sure that it complies with our zoning regulations, our city policies and standards, um, but we would not enforce a, a separate agreement, a, a private agreement. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, I'd like to uh, get through these last couple of questions quickly so we can get back to the speakers. Um, how to guarantee uh, additional entry points uh, to the site if this site is, is chosen as a housing opportunity site? That's a really good question. I think um, the project team probably need to think about that. Um, but um, Maybe I can just quickly jump in there again. And I think people have referenced that it, it's quite a complicated site um, with the access today. So, and without, again, a specific thing that we're evaluating, it is, it is something that we have to, to look into and, and identify what options were possible and feasible and it involved lots of conversations with other, uh, other parties, right? Because we've got Caltrans and the county and, and others as well. So it's, it's not, a, it's something that, that, as you say, needs a little bit of work and thinking before there's an immediate answer on that. Thank you, Hugh. And uh, the last question we haven't answered is what are the mechanisms to limit units? Uh, really, uh, the main thing to focus on there is that if that's your area of interest, uh, understandably, um, there's a lot of interest in that topic. Uh, you really want to look at the base density uh, and within the housing element across the board, uh, it's 30 dwelling units per acre, which is a very important number for, for housing element compliance purposes. Uh, that, that's a density level that has a built-in assumption of affordability um, from, the, from the regulators in Sacramento. And so that's, that's sort of a magic number in terms of housing elements. Um, and as a community, and as and as uh, whether you whether you think that's too low or too high, um, the main thing is to uh, you know stay engaged with this process and go to meetings like this, uh, especially when we go to what we call the decision makers, the housing commission, the planning commission, the city council. Uh, it's a public process. Um, everything is done in public. All the decisions are done in public at those public meetings. Um, and so to, is, is to really make your voice heard and ultimately what the council decides um, as the base density will be, uh, will be the me mechanism uh, that will control the, the number of units on the property. Having said that, uh, totally separate from anything the city has control over, uh, the state has a whole package of density bonus laws um, that in some case can, can double the can double, can, can come close to doubling the density. For example, an 80% uh, density bonus. So there's there's those things to consider, um, but the main the main thing is is the the city council in their discretion uh, has has the ability to to control the, the base density. And with that, we'll uh, jump back into uh, the remaining speakers. This meeting was originally scheduled to be an hour from seven to eight. Uh, but the the city team has agreed um, to go at least until nine, uh, given the widespread uh, interest. And so we'd like to make sure everyone who wants to speak uh, gets to do gets to do that. Thanks, Jeff. Our next speaker will be L. Simons, followed by Margarita Mendez. We can come back to L. Simons. Um, I'll now turn it over to Margarita Mendez, followed by Mercedes Hostler. Hello, neighbors um, and city um, people. Um, my name is Margarita Mendez, and I live on Lorelei Lane. And I'm I'm a teacher, and I've been teaching for thirty years. Uh, Twenty of those years have been in Palo Alto, and um, and I'm a resident. I, I live right next door to Suburban Park. Every morning I walk my dogs with my neighbor over in Suburban Park and we say hello to our neighbors there. And I support um, the building of affordable housing on the Sheridan property, on the property of the Ravenswood School District. Um, I wanna remind everyone that our neighborhoods used to belong to the Ravenswood School District. And 
my next door neighbor, along with probably some of the older neighbors in um, Suburban Park, fought really hard to get into the Menlo Park City School District for a variety of reasons. Um, every day, I ride my electric bicycle 10 miles to work. And, um, and when I listen to my neighbors in Suburban Park talk about the drivers, um, I'm concerned about the drivers in my neighborhood right now <laughs> um, who do not pay attention to, to me and the middle schoolers and elementary school students who will ride our bikes on Bay Road and Ravenswood. Um, and so I think we can all slow down, um, but I know that my husband and I were very lucky as are many of my neighbors that I'm listening to, to be able to afford to live here. It, a lot of it was luck of when we purchased our homes um, because the people that will be living um, in the apartments there are not so lucky and our children will not be as lucky as we were to be able to buy real estate in Menlo Park or in the Bay Area for that matter. Um, and it was luck because they work hard too. And I work hard, but a lot of it was luck of when we were able to purchase. And we just need to, you know, when I, I my whole life, 53 years I have lived in the Bay Area. And, um, and I see lots of people living on the streets. Um, and that's not okay. And we, are, we have an opportunity to make a difference in our community, to house people. And we need to do that. So I support the building of affordable housing for teachers, staff um, there on the old flood park, uh, flood school um, lot. So thank you very much for um, having me and for providing this forum for people to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Mercedes Hostler, and then we'll uh, turn it back to Ella Simons. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm not against uh, totally about um, affordable housing being built. Um, I know that there's a shortage of people um, to be able to buy a home. To, um, and so, but I think it has to be done um, with the most, um, uh, as careful as possible so that there's not um, a lot of um, impact on us uh, residents. I live here in Suburban Park. I lived here for over 30 years. And um, over the years, I've seen that um, um, a lot of people are driving faster. Um, and so when the school used to be open, um, people would, drive by really fast, even still right now, people are driving really fast. So um, I think if this project goes through, um, I think it should be done as carefully as possible. So not to impact um, our lives um, and, and make it as safe as possible for all of us that live here, children and adults, um, people that walk around with their little walkers, um, kids playing on the street, um, bicyclists, um, people walking their dogs. So um, thank you for having us um, give you our input. And I hope um, this project is done as carefully as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is L. Simons, followed by Carolyn Bosher. This is uh, Laird Simons. I'm a uh, Menlo Park resident for the last uh, 25 years plus, and I've uh, been a decade on the Ravenswood Education Foundation board and would like to speak a little bit from that perspective, although I certainly don't speak for the board. We've been in an exciting period recently with uh, a largely new school board, a new superintendent, uh, a new chief business officer, and most recently, uh, a marvelous agreement that's been reached with uh, the various players, uh, including the uh, teachers union, uh, that allows us to come up with a much more competitive uh, pr proposal for paying our teachers and uh, having merit-based reviews. Part of that uh, most recent uh, uh, proposal is being 
financed uh, by uh, donations from the community. Uh, and uh, there's been a very active participation, but a lot of it uh, to become self uh, funding uh, requires leasing of excess school properties, including the site that we're discussing tonight, as well as one other site. And so I wanted to provide just a little bit of that perspective. Uh, you know, it's important to our donors that uh, there be a, a path to sustainability and this lease uh, that would be involved with this property is part of the piece of the puzzle to do that so that it has a profound impact on the ability of us to pay our teachers and, and pay them at an appropriate level. The fact uh, the uh, chief business officer uh, of the district has looked at a number of alternatives for this space and the conclusion for this partial is that uh, this housing that could be used for teachers uh, and for staff below a certain income level uh, seems to be the best uh, possible proposal. And so we have a situation where we really have a win-win. We have the uh, opportunity to raise additional funds uh, to uh, pay our teachers uh, the salaries that they deserve and merit. And we also have the ability to allow teachers to live uh, and staff members to live uh, closer to the school than they might otherwise be able to do with all the benefits uh, that that entails. So that basically we have you know, a win-win for the school district and for the teachers and obviously, you know, for the students. Uh, obviously, we all want to be sensitive to the immediate community and, and what their concerns are. And uh, we would uh, hope that you, and you know, do what you can to mitigate, you know, the impacts that they've raised about which they're you know, most concerned. But this is just a, a marvelous project and I strongly support it as a result. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker uh, will be phone number ending in 0377. Uh, Carolyn, I saw that you lowered your hand, so I will now turn to this next speaker ending in 0377. And following that will be Liz Hope. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, I am fully in support of uh, agreeable I'm um, agreeable to affordable housing for teachers. Uh, a little bit of context of who I am. Uh, I'm a uh, first generation immigrant. I have uh, worked in and uh, lived in underserved communities uh, for many years of my life, including in East Palo Alto, as well as in inner city Boston and Dorchester, uh, offering technology education and uh, training to uh, underserved uh, communities there. And I've chosen to live in these communities because I believe in the impact that we can have in uh, educating our students there. Uh, with that background, uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, there's uh, a need for affordable housing, uh, but uh, just not here. So I fully am against this. And so I wanted to provide a little bit more context around the, uh, the neighborhood that uh, the uh, proposed site is uh, going to be uh, in. And, um, uh, some of the comments I won't repeat because uh, I think everybody's talked about the uh, nature of uh, Suburban Park, the 240 homes. Uh, many uh, in this uh, neighborhood consider it to be one of the last Leave it to Beaver neighborhoods where uh, kids play on the streets, where there's uh, a high degree of trust and safety. And uh, with 270, 540, whatever the uh, number of cars and also the uh, vehicles that we're going through will completely transform uh, that neighborhood and make it unsafe in many ways that people would consider it a, uh, a given in that, in that area. The other context around this is that uh, certainly there's no perfect site. Uh, we recognize that we've all been in the Bay Area for as long as we have, but uh, this is the wrong area because there's a couple of things that uh, uh, for someone who's lived in that uh, area uh, should know. Uh, the first is that it's not just the traffic on a one uh, uh, on the cul-de-sac in Hedge Road and Sheraton, which is uh, a uh, you know narrow street, as many have uh, spoken of, but also uh, just off of that is Bay Road, and uh, going on and off of uh, Bay Road into say. Um, Ringwood Avenue uh, is, there's a ton of traffic there already and uh, the traffic can be backed up uh, for, uh, you know, that entire block as uh, residents are going to Menlo Atherton High School. And there are uh, students and families that come from East Palo Alto from the Eastern part of Menlo Park who come already from that area. So uh, there's a ton of traffic already that's backed up. And then also on Bay Road on the rush hour times as they're trying to get onto Willow Road uh, during that uh, rush hour time, that traffic can be backed up for 
uh, you know, five, 10 blocks on end. And uh, the, the wait there could be even today without extra, um, you know, residents or a, uh, you know, hundreds of new cars could be half an hour or more just to get off of uh, Bay Road. Uh, people are making illegal turns onto Del Norte Avenue, which is an illegal turn during these uh, morning uh, rush hour times. So we're already seeing it with the uh, current uh, load of uh, families coming in and out of the neighborhood to Menlo, pa uh, Menlo Park, uh, Atherton High School, to um, their employment centers, to Stanford hospitals, all the different areas. So adding this additional uh, uh, residences is just is just cripple this uh, not only the suburban park neighborhood but the entire area in terms of the amount of traffic on Bay Road on uh, Ringwood uh, on and off of Willow and it's just uh, I, I don't see a way that that could be sustainable so uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, you know I'm a proponent and support affordable housing. Uh, and I don't disagree that uh, there is uh, not a perfect location. It's just not here. So I'm fully um, unsupportive of this project. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Liz Hove, and then I'll turn it back to Carolyn Bosher. Hi there. Thank you. Um, first, I also am a proponent for affordable housing and also proponent for Ravenswood School District in which I volunteer. I believe in their mission and the work that the teachers do there. But with that said, I am finding this conversation incredibly frustrating. Um, for people that are unfamiliar with our neighborhood to say they're gung-ho for building large scale, a large scale dense apartment building in a residential neighborhood in a small cul-de-sac with only one narrow access point. This is a, it's again, it's very frustrating. Basically the housing element, the city of Menlo Park, et cetera, are ready to sacrifice our neighborhood in order to reach or, or hit their agenda points or their whatever it is that they are trying to achieve. And we're going to be the ones that sacrifice I had two questions. One is, would the housing element back the site um, before the issue of um, the access, additional access roads is determined? And then my second question is, is how many teachers would actually be living at the site? If it's 200 units that go up or 90 units that go up, is it going to be filled predominantly by teachers and would they qualify financially for the site? Thank you for my uh, giving me time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Carolyn Bosher, followed by Michal. Hi, this is Carolyn. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Carolyn Bauscher. I'm a Menlo Park resident of 24 years. I've also been on a REF board member for the Ravenswood Education Foundation for six years. I'd just like to voice my strong support of the project. I feel like we've been listening to our Menlo Park neighbors, um, a lot of whom have had concerns about the project, and I echo Laird's comments that I hope that you guys will listen to their concerns about the egress, and I'd love to help, you know, in any way that I could um, work with the county and Caltrans to help get additional points of egress because it seems like listening to those, this whole meeting, that's one of the main concerns of the neighbors. I know that when the school was there, we had about 300 kids, uh, students, and then we had a staff of approximately 50 people. So I don't think it's tenable and I don't think it's gonna be a good solution to have an empty lot there. I don't think you can, can compare the traffic of an empty lot to the traffic of any proposed development because I think that this is this Ravenswood School District's land and they have the right to use it. Um, and I think that's just a reasonable position. Um, also, I just wanted to speak in um, a positive terms about the opportunity that this project is pr um, providing all of us in Menlo Park. 20% of our Menlo Park neighbors live in Bellhaven. That all those people, they, they can send their school, their children to the, the Bellhaven school and the Ravenswood schools. So this one project can benefit 20% of the people that live in Menlo Park. Um, in addition, it can help some of our neighbors who live in East Palo Alto, who are also part of the Ravenswood District. So 1,500 students and their families can be benefited by this project because of the money that it raises for the teachers and staff. 
Um, these students, 99% are students of color, 93% live below the poverty line, 43% of the students are homeless or housing insecure. So we're really helping our most vulnerable residents. And it makes me so happy that we have something this innovative and creative. Um, this is also, so, so because of the students we're helping, this is an equity issue. And I think it's important for us to make sure that we realize we can help solve an equity issue here in Menlo Park with this, with this um, plan. Also, um, the second opportunity provides is for teachers. Currently, the, the Ravenswood teachers are the lowest paid in the county. And as Laird said, we have this wonderful new plan that district leadership has put forth. And um, we're so excited about being able to pay our teachers more, but it would also be great to ret help retain them if they could live near our schools, as other people have said. But I wanted to let some of the, my Menlo Park neighbors know, I know a lot of the teachers in Ravenswood and they're wonderful people. They're, in my opinion, they're missionaries. They have huge hearts and lots of love. And I would love to be neighbors with any of them. They're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, to address some of the other questions about whether there'd be enough teachers to live there, staff, I believe, would also be eligible to live there. And the staff are also wonderful people. They're also not highly paid. And um, they also, even though they deserve to be, they love those kids and they would love the kids in your neighborhood too. And they'd be fantastic neighbors. And then third, I just wanted to say, I think that you, um, the district has a right to use their land. And this is a really strategic use of that land. So if we shoot down this project, we make it a less strategic use of the land, but I don't think the neighbors should expect zero use of the land. Um, this is strategic because it helps um, with teacher retention. And I just hope we can all, as all Menlo Park neighbors come together as neighbors and community members and support this innovative and creative plan. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Mihao, followed by Rhonda White. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, looks like I got muted three times. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak. Thank you for um, um, extending the session to uh, hear from everybody. Um, my name is Miha Bortnik. I live in Menlo Park. Uh, and I, uh, I really also want to thank the speaker before me uh, for sharing uh, all that information. I'm, I'm here to express support for the Ravenwood School District. Um, as we just heard, it serves the most underserved communities in our city. And I believe it really deserves all of our appreciation and support. And in particular, the, the, the teachers in the Ravenswood School District, uh, I looked it up on, on average, they have significantly low salaries and more students in their classrooms than, uh, than teachers in the other school districts in our town. And I'm really grateful for, for their hard work. Um, <clears throat> I also support affordable housing at the flood school site because our city desperately needs it. And here I have questions for for the staff, because it seems like we don't have clarity here about exactly what the needs are and, and how many viable options we have. So um, we, we heard that there are only two viable sites or two vacant sites uh, left for these purposes in Elemental Park. Um, and so my question is, in order to meet our requirements under the state law, how many 100% affordable housing sites do we need to develop? So that's the first question. How many if, if we only have two, how many do we need to develop? And then um, how many of the known sites, uh, vacant or not, are there where the owner has actually expressed any interest in developing 100% affordable housing like Ravenswood did? And I, I guess one more question. So why is the school site zoned as a single family parcel? On the face of it, does not make sense? Could you explain why that is? Um, and again, I'd like to end with, uh, with appreciation for everything that the Ravenswood School District has done and continues to do uh, for the most underserved communities in our city. And I hope we can all find constructive ways to support them. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Rhonda White, followed by Brittany Baxter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone for giving us the opportunity to come together and have this conversation. It's very important that we get as much real time information as possible so that we can make very informed decisions. First and foremost, my name is Rhonda White. I am a proud teacher of in the Ravenswood City School District. Many of you have said, well, how many teachers would actually live here? Well, there's 115 teachers in Ravenswood and we have over 200 classified staff members. Those would be janitors, um, campus relations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to be very brief because we're all tired. Thank you for the additional time. So first off, um, there's been some issues with transparency or this or that. Let's also be real. The Ravenswood City School District is proposing to build 90 units, 90, not 265, not 15, 90 units. Let's clear that one up first. Second off, I've already said we already have over 300 employees in Ravenswood who would love to be able to afford a place to stay within walking, biking. Um, I think one of the ladies said electric biking, anything that close to school so that yes, we could spend more time with our students in our community. Um, I also want to make it very clear, and I know this was not anyone's intention, but it made it seem like that the teachers and the staff of Ravenswood would come over there and tear up your community. Why would anyone move into any community with the intention of tearing it up? That's where I live every day. So I wouldn't want to do that. Um, another thing I want to bring up is it has been mentioned that the air quality along the sound barrier is unsafe to build a school there. So how is it that the two and three million dollar homes there and Haven House, which all house individuals, peoples, children, adults and residents, how are they allowed to stay there and breathe the same air that we can't breathe. So I'm very confused with that. So I'm hoping that will make it onto the um, question is that 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 sounds contradictory. Um, and yes, we do want to talk about social justice. And we want to talk about equity. It is time for the Ravenswood City School District to be able to use their public lands to be able to better serve the community, the families, and those who are taking the time to serve our youth. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak. If anybody else would like to talk to me, I'm in Ravenswood, you can find me. Have a blessed day. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you for your comment. So the next speaker will be Brittany Baxter followed by Skip Hilton. And then the last three speakers will be Steve Wong, Marlene Santoyo, and John Pimentel. These are the speakers that I noted down when we did our last call for comments at 8 p.m. So the next speaker will be Brittany Baxter. Hello, I'm Brittany Baxter. I um, also live here in Menlo Park. Would love to second the very powerful comment right ahead of me by Ms. White. Um, I'm also calling in support of Ravenswood's interest in creating affordable homes on these on their property. Um, I noticed earlier in the poll that 40% of people who are here tonight um, both live and work in Menlo Park. And I think these homes are so fantastic for many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that the workers are already here in Menlo Park. They're working hard, they're contributing to our community. Everybody has mentioned earlier how much they love the staff at Ravenswood. It would be great if they could be able to afford to live in the community that they contribute so much to. Um, I also wish that part of, as part of the community input process, as we think about that, you know, we've heard a lot from residents like myself who are comfortably housed here, but I would really like to broaden the definition of who we consider when we contact the community um, and make sure that we are especially reaching out to fantastic Ravenswood staff like Ms. White from earlier um, and hearing all the sides, you know, of that conversation. So if you work here and you would like to live here, I think that is a, a very valid point that we should be considering as well um, when defining community stakeholders. Um, I'm also hearing, you know, a lot of comments tonight in favor of keeping the physical environment the same. And, you know, in this case, again, same is kind of referring to a vacant lot that has been in the neighborhood for a long time. Um, but when the physical environment doesn't change, things still change around us. When the cost of living spikes, we lose our school staff, like the teacher who spoke much earlier in the evening. We lose our workers downtown. We have vacant storefronts. We lose our healthcare staff. Our friends move away. 
We've all seen the impacts and the people that do still make the sacrifice to come and work here and commute in from you know, far away. Um, that's the traffic that we see. And so when I hear pushback around things like traffic or access, I see so many opportunities for solutions. You know, I live near a school myself. I live a little bit closer to downtown. We have traffic, but we also have people and bikes, people on transit. Um, and I think there's a really a lot of great opportunities to kind of reimagine how we get around our city, how we get from point A to point B in a more inclusive, climate-friendly, more pleasant way than, than sitting in traffic. Um, and I would just like to close, you know, tonight by kind of noting a bit of a, a comparison that kind of sticks out in my mind. You know, um, last week there was a review for a project over in District 1 in Bellhaven, massive, you know, projects actually going in there, right? Like a couple thousand units for development. Um, that community is really stepping up and figuring out how to work with that development. And it, I just really see, you know, honestly, a point of comparison between the public feedback process um, in District 1 and then what we see, you know, on this side of 101 as well. Um, so I really wish that we could all adopt a bit of a better approach to being more open to creating that change we would like to see and creating those affordable homes that so many people have expressed interest in tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Skip Hilton, followed by Steve Wong. Hi there. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. Thanks for uh, presenting and for reaching out to the community. Uh, my name is Skip Hilton. I am also a resident of a suburban park here in Menlo Park and have lived here on the home for um, almost 30 years. Um, what, one thing I want to start out with was just a set of questions. The presentation up front was, was kind of short and pretty quick. So um, I did have a couple questions I'd love to add to the list. Uh, one is, first of all, will those slides be available and where will they be available so we can take a look at them later? Uh, second is, um, I think that they said that this site is currently zoned for um, single family homes and not for multifamily units. So I think really at the at the end of the day, this is a zoning question that has to be answered first and foremost. And I believe that's the issue that's that's driving the input um, is that the city has to rezone it for that. But I'd love to make sure that that's confirmed. Um, much of the uh, housing advocacy on the call tonight was focused on the housing for teachers and staff um, and specifically Ravenswood. I guess my other question is, is this unit, will it have um, covenants on it that restrict it to housing for just teachers and staff and also just teachers and staff of Ravenswood or could other teachers from other districts live there or could non-teachers uh, also occupy? Um, this has been brought up before, but there was no discussion in the slides up front about alternate access points to the site. Um, this is a big issue of contention for the neighbors here in Suburban Park. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that more later. But the question is, could alternate access points be required for this development to go through um, to mitigate the traffic issues here? Um, and then my, my last question is that, that it's been mentioned there's a couple of sites that are available for this type of development in Menlo Park. I know one of them is the SRI site, which is, I understand, can accommodate like 400 units. It's closer to downtown and public transit. It wouldn't create as many car trips. So I'm question is, what's the priority of this project uh, location versus SRI? Are they being considered equally? Are they both going to be considered or is, is one considered preferable to the other? Um, I know a number of housing advocates that spoke tonight. I know them personally. I also appreciate the need for more affordable housing in our community myself, um, but I do not think this is the ideal site for that, a high density housing. Uh, I encourage anybody that believes they have an opinion on the fitness of the site for high density to come walk our neighborhood and see the current configuration, essentially a narrow access point on Sheraton Road. And it's essentially like a flag lot that sits behind our neighborhood. I think if 90 units is the cap, I mean, that would be a, that would be appreciated. It's still very high density and will have an impact on the neighborhood. But if it's built to the max of 260 units, that's more than the number of homes that are in our neighborhood currently. So it's essentially like adding a whole neighborhood on the back of our neighborhood, all accessible through a single flag lot entrance at the back. Uh, it's just not a good setup the way it's currently configured, and it needs to be rethought. It's no surprise that 71% of the people on this call live in District 2 and 63% of them live right here in Suburban Park. This is a big issue for the folks that live here. They, they believe, and I think rightfully so, it'll create a permanent change in the quality of life. Um, but that does not mean that everybody here or even anybody here is NIMBY about it. And, and they do want to be open to developing some type of housing. They don't wanna see the lot remain vacant. Um, 
the city has a choice here to either work with the local neighbors that are directly impacted by a high density residential project right, ne right next to their, their home and come up with creative solutions that can both reach our housing goals, but still address the density access and safety issues, or the city could treat my neighbors as the enemy, not listen to them, assume they are just NIMBY, or worse, as was raised on this call, potentially racist redlining residents that need to be bulldozed or ignored. I don't think that that's the right approach. I think we have to open up dialogue. Katie Baruzzi is a local neighbor in Triangle and she, and she mentioned Haven House. I think this is a really important example. Haven House is located adjacent to this parcel. It's a great transitional housing option, lower density multifamily, but it, it's, it's, a, it's something our neighborhood supports. In fact, many of us in our neighborhood volunteer there or have supported Haven House through donations. I am pretty sure if we had open discussions about extending the type of development that Haven House has right now and the same densities, you would not have that much resistance at all from the neighbors. You may only be able to put 60 or 75 units in there, but I think it would accommodate many of the educators and staff of affordable housing, and it would truly be a win-win-win-win, including for the local neighbors. But if the project is left to developers to maximize profit, Ravenswood District to maximize its units on their lease, Menlo Park to satisfy the housing requirement by cramming a whole bunch of units into this parcel, it's going to be a win-win-win for those groups, but it's going to be a big loss and lose for the, my local neighbors in this neighborhood that have made their home here, invested in it, raised their children, and they're going to suffer an irreversible hit to the quality of life. So I hope we can continue the dialogue. I hope the city and planning will continue to engage our neighbors to come up with creative solutions that can actually truly be a win-win-win-win for all parties. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Steve. Hello. Um, well said, Skip. You said a lot of things that I echo. I also am a resident of Suburban Park, um, born and bred. In fact, I went to flood school when it was a school there. Um, and yes, I am for teacher housing or for teacher housing, but um, but not density. And since so many support teacher housing, but not density, why and how were the Sharon Park site and others taken off the table so quickly? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Marlene Santoyo and then followed by our last speaker, John Pimentel. I do note that we have other hand raised this, at this evening. Uh, we did do a last call at 8 p.m. where I noted the speakers for this evening. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we did envision that this meeting uh, would run from seven to eight, so we've already extended to nine and we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. If there are other comments that you're interested in providing, please feel free to reach out to the Housing Element Update Project team at our project website, which Tom mentioned earlier, and I'll paste that into our chat which is menlopark.org slash housing element. And I'll now turn it over to Marlene. Hi, thank you. Um, so my name is um, Marlene and I'm an organizer with Menlo Together. And we're a group of Menlo Park and Peninsula residents who envision a city that is integrated and diverse, multi-generational and environmentally sustainable. And since yesterday, more than 25 people have signed onto our petition in strong support of the Ravens city school district proposal to create affordable housing for teachers and school staff at the former flood school site. And so I also want to add that I grew up in East Palo Alto and continue to have family and friends, um, younger siblings attending the Ravenswood school district or city schools. And so from a very young age, um, my siblings and I could see how teachers and staff needed more support. Um, as a student in elementary school, um, we were aware of their long commutes and time constraints to prepare for class or for even for other staff to complete their work. And as little ones, we tried to help. Like during after school, we would, some students and I would stay after school to help teachers organize their materials, the, like the library, um, and just organize in general because they didn't have time to do certain tasks that teachers usually um, do. And 
um, my brother would stay after school on Fridays and he would help the, the one custodian staff that the school had to clean and maintain the entire school. And so um, I want to just share that I'm in start, strong support of using public lands to provide affordable housing for teachers and staff in the Ravenswood uh, City School District who also serve Memo Park residents who have been historically um, underserved. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I'll now turn it over to our last speaker for this evening, John Pimentel. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I am also a resident of Menlo Park, and um, I would like to start by saying that I thought the comments from Skip Hilton were excellent and hit perfectly on the tone necessary to make a good project and uh, to maintain the neighborhood uh, character and, um, uh, and what people in Suburban Park love about their neighborhood. Uh, my background is that I currently serve on the Menlo Park Housing Commission. I also serve on the Ravenswood Education Foundation Board. I coach baseball in the Ravenswood Little League over in Bellhaven and EPA, and I, I currently serve as a community college trustee for the County Community College District. Uh, in a previous life, I served as the Deputy Secretary for Transportation for the State of California, where I oversaw Caltrans and the Transportation Commission, so I have some experience in understanding transportation issues and transportation planning, which is why I thought Skip's comments were so on target. I strongly support this project from, from four different perspectives. First, from a transportation perspective, uh, it's a legitimate concern regarding the traffic volumes accessing through Hedge Road. And I think that first, we would note that a residential use uh, for this land that would generate less traffic uh, than a school ever would, but um, that's something that can be studied and should be studied thoroughly as part of the planning process. And from that, I bet that we'll end up with uh, proposals to provide additional egress through Flood Park uh, in the redesign that's happening there, and even through the Van Buren Road access at Life Moves, which could uh, alleviate and give multiple ingress and egress park points for um, for the facility that would reduce the impact on suburban park. I'm hopeful that's what comes out of a robust planning process. From a housing perspective, um, Menlo Park's housing element does need to generate a lot of units. We are building in um, the SRI site. Um, there'll be, there's opportunities to build on the west side, though not enough. Bellhaven has already taken a lot of growth. And so this is an opportunity for um, for this neighborhood, as all neighborhoods in the city should uh, should be uh, participating in uh, in our necessary housing growth. If we're not proactive in producing that housing, ultimately state mandates will cause our city to lose um, uh, any control over our local land use. So um, being proactive and planning well is the best is the best approach. From an education perspective, uh, enabling teachers to live in the community where they where they teach enhances the experience for everyone involved. Um, in, a, in a unique way to look at this is it's a form of compensation for teachers that allows the district to attract and retain the best teachers. And it can happen without increasing taxes or um, dealing with the constraints, typical constraints of the teachers unions. It's a, it's a, a different way to attract and retain those young and committed teachers who we want to have uh, working with our kids. And then lastly, from a, from a community perspective, the teachers and the essential staff at the schools are necessary. They, they are having an impugned quality of life, having to commute in from faraway places. And, um, and there'll be an uplifting presence in any neighborhood, including um, all three that may be affected by this project. Uh, ultimately, it'll be a project that will help build the bridge between um, our, sep our community that is separated by the highway. So in, in conclusion, having a, a, 
a bunch of teachers living next door sure seems like a better alternative than than uh, than what has existed there for the last decade, whether it's a vacant school or an empty lot full of weeds. And it, the project will be a valuable strategic asset for the school district. Um, and it and it demonstrates the school district thinking creatively creatively to solve its problem. So thank you all for the people who participated. Um, and I uh, return to Skip's comment and hope that a robust planning process here yields a transportation plan that um, that mitigates the, the legitimate concerns that were raised tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And that concludes the listening session for tonight's community meeting. And I'll just remind everyone that uh, you are able to learn more about the housing element update as well as to contact members of our housing element update project team by visiting our menlopark.org slash housing element website. And I'll now turn it back to Deanna and Jeff to give some closing remarks. Thanks, Calvin. Um, I was going to go through it and at a, at a very high level, try to answer the dozen uh, questions that have been asked uh, that haven't been answered yet. But I would like to commit to the over 100 people that attended this meeting that we will we will take all the questions that we've written down here. And we will take additional questions out of the chat and we will develop a uh, FAQ uh, question and response that will be in writing and will be carried forward into the public meetings and also uh, posted on the housing element uh, website. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, jump in quickly um, and then Deanna will, will provide some uh, brief closing comments of, of around the next steps. Um, a question about would the housing element uh, include the site uh, before the access issue is resolved? Um, it's possible that there could be a, a policy that, that could be structured around uh, providing additional access uh, in order to meet uh, certain density parameters. Um, so that's definitely something, um, something for further discussion. Um, how many teachers will live at the site? Uh, we don't know that at this point. Uh, sounds like from the school district side, uh, there would be a combination of, of teachers and staff if that, if that project becomes a reality. But I think uh, the housing element itself uh, would obviously have to uh, move forward independently. Uh, in order to meet RENA, um, how, many, how many sites do we need to develop? Uh, the, the affordable housing target is actually closer to 1,500 units. It includes very low income households, low income households, as well as moderate income households. Uh, so not the 900 that was mentioned earlier, but closer to 1,500. Uh, we have a sites inventory that could yield up to 3,000 units. And so roughly uh, half of, of all of those would need to develop in order to meet our targets. And the, the more 100% the more affordable projects that are created, uh, the more affordable units obviously would be uh, constructed and would, would be more on target uh, to, meet the, to meet the new housing requirements. How many sites have owner interest? Uh, we'll have to report back on that. That's an ongoing effort uh, to communicate and contact uh, owners. Uh, why is this school site zoned for single family? I don't know. We will research that and include that in the FAQ. Uh, how can existing residents and the Haven House uh, be uh, there on the ground with some of the existing air quality issues? Uh, that's a that's a long, complicated answer, and we will we will provide a written response to that. Uh, will slides be available? Yes, those will be posted on the website. Uh, rezoning would be necessary, as one of the speaker asked, um, to go from an R one zoning uh, to something uh, to something with a higher density. Uh, covenants to limit residents uh, to teachers and staff. Um, since since there's, since there's another public agency involved under this scenario uh, that this question is predicated on, uh, that's a little bit of a tricky question and we'll, we'll consult with the city's attorneys and, and craft an appropriate response. But it does get into uh, issues around different levels of government and how they relate to each other. Um, can alternate entry points be required? I think the, the, uh, the city would be within its discretionary powers um, to require uh, entry points, especially uh, when they're deciding whether to include a site or not uh, within the housing element. Uh, what is the priority of this project over SRI? 
uh, SRI is considered a pipeline project in the housing element, and it is uh, being utilized in an equal manner uh, in terms of all the sites within the housing element uh, to provide that 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 capacity to provide to provide affordable housing. And why were Sharon Heights sites taken off so quickly? I believe this was a reference um, to some community discussions around converting a portion of Sharon Park uh, to a housing opportunity site. It was never officially uh, part of the, the uh, city housing element team uh, uh, process, uh, but it had become a, a talking point in the community and it, it quickly went up to council and council uh, directed that, that we not we not consider any any parks or open space uh, for housing opportunity sites. So with that, um, again, just a reminder, we'll we'll do a proper job of answering all these questions in writing and posting those in, in places where people can find them. And I'll turn it over uh, to Deanna to uh, talk about next steps. Great, thank you, Jeff. And thank you for everyone for participating and being here uh, this evening. Uh, it was a very, um, good conversation and one that we will follow up on as Jeff mentioned. I think um, I think Cal, if you can put in our, our website again in the chat, that will that will be the location where we house um, the slides from this presentation, the recording from this presentation, our FAQs that we will be putting together. So our housing element site um, is really the 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 place for information um, about um, what is happening, what has happened if you're, you're playing catch up and, and what to look forward to. So in terms of a next step, our, our next um, milestone will be releasing a draft housing element document. We are uh, getting close and, and wrapping up the, the finishing um, uh, documents so that, that they can be publicly released for a 30 day comment period. We anticipate having public meetings um, with the, the, hopefully with the planning commission and, and Housing Commission and the City Council, so that those will also be opportunities for you to provide your feedback um, to the commissions and to the City Council. So please look forward um, to that announcement. We will make that available on our on our website, our, our Housing Element website, and uh, we will also um, be putting out um, uh, notifications like uh, through uh, our, our email um, subscription um, and other. Um, social efforts, social media efforts. So thank you again for being here with us. Thank you for sticking with us for two and a half hours. Um, it, it was it was really um, great to, to hear from so many residents. And hope you have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.